This meeting is now being recorded. Um, so, and so, and, um, so a copy of the slides and the recording will be distributed to all participants at the end um, of the presentation. Once again, thank you for joining the Business Council for Sustainable Energy and the Solar Foundation webinar on PACE financing in D.C. Here is a brief agenda for the webinar today. Um, Lisa Jacobson, President of DCSD, and Alex Wynn with the Solar Foundation will kick us off with a welcome and introduction to both of our organizations, as well as some background on the BCSD Sustainable Energy in America Factbook. And then Alex will take us through a little PACE 101 for us PACE novices out there. And then our main speakers, Kenley Farmer with the D.C. Department of Energy and Environment will speak, followed by Ian Fisher with Urban Ingenuity and Cliff Staten with Renew Financial. I'm going to briefly introduce each of the speakers before handing it over to Lisa Jacobson. Uh, Lisa is president of DCSE. She has advised state and federal policymakers on energy tax and air quality climate issues. She's a private sector observer to the World Bank's Climate Investment Fund and a member of the Department of Energy's Energy Efficiency Steering Committee. She has testified in front of Congress numerous times and has led uh, delegations of clean energy industries to the UN Convention on Climate Change. Alex Wynn is Program Director with the Solar Foundation. He directs a number of the Solar Foundation's key programs, including two DOE-funded programs, Civic Pace and the Sunshot Solar Outreach Partnership. Prior to that, he was a member of the GW Solar Institute, as well as a staff member of the Solar Energies Industries Association um, and a member of their government affairs team. Kenley Farmer is the program manager with the DC Department of Energy and the Environment. She's also analyst for the district's weatherization and LEHEAP program. Uh, not sure if I said that acronym correctly, uh, but Anyways, prior to joining DOEE, Kenley was the project manager for a $1.5 million HUD grant. She has also been a fellow with the White House Council on Environmental Quality and an attorney, and an attorney for five years before that. Ian Fisher is Chief Operating Officer of Urban Ingenuity. Um, he, in this occupation, he oversees project origination and development, financial and technical energy underwriting for every project financed by the company and leads the design and development of custom energy and financial models. Prior to Urban Ingenuity, Ian was Vice President at Clean Energy Solutions, an energy efficiency consulting firm. And finally, we have Cliff, Cliff Staten, Executive Vice President with Renew Financial. Cliff has spent 20 years as founding partner with the political strategy and media relations consulting firm of Staten and Hughes prior to Renew Financial, where he crafted winning campaigns and messages for hundreds of candidates, corporations, nonprofit organizations, and government agencies, and helped to get a number of elected officials elected to office from president to city council. And now I will turn it over to Lisa Jacobson, who's president of the Business Council for Sustainable Energy, to introduce uh, BCSE, as well as introduce participants to our 2016 Sustainable Energy in America Factbook that's produced each year with Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Thank you, Zoe, and thank you very much to the Solar Foundation for co-hosting this webinar with us today. Uh, very briefly, I want to just talk about the Business Council for Sustainable Energy and its interest in PACE. Um, PACE is a really exciting financial tool, whether it be at the residential level or commercial and industrial levels. And the last several years has seen a dramatic uptake in PACE legislation and PACE-enabling uh, frameworks hits on an essential part of the economy. How can we make our buildings more efficient? How can we get the co-benefits from that activity, including environmental, better environmental performance, uh, better uh, experience for tenants, and how do we achieve that economic development benefit as we bring workers in and create a whole economy about improving our buildings? So talking today about PACE, and hearing from those right on the front lines how PACE has evolved is very exciting to me personally. So I'm going to speak just very briefly to uh, get us right to the PACE 101 that Alice will provide. But the Business Council for Sustainable Energy is a trade association. We were formed in the early 1990s, and we represent a very broad spectrum of clean energy businesses and associations. We span the demand side and supply side energy efficiency industries, the portfolio of renewable energy technologies, 
and the natural gas sectors. We have utilities, public power, uh, equipment manufacturers, uh, end users, uh, many in the building space. So, you know, we have a lot of excitement, as I said, about PACE. If you want to learn a little bit more about the Business Council for Sustainable Energy, I encourage you to check out our website, www.bcse.org. This is just um, a snapshot from our website. We have a coast-to-coast -coast interactive map where you can drill down and, and learn more about what our companies are doing on the ground and some of their major projects. As Zoe mentioned, the Business Council for Sustainable Energy has been a partner with Bloomberg New Energy Finance on putting together a Sustainable Energy in America Factbook. We are in our fourth year of this project, and we just released the fourth edition on February 4th, 2016. It has some really exciting findings, especially when we're looking at energy efficiency. If you want to learn more about the Factbook, we have a website, and the Factbook in its full 150-plus uh, slide deck format is available there. We have a new state spotlight section where we're pulling out all the state and regional data. We have graphics. We have videos. We have um, a slide deck which goes through the major findings of the fact book from 2016. What you're looking at now is an image of just part of the website, and here is a, another image for you. So I encourage you to take a look at the fact book and use the materials, and we always welcome feedback on how we're presenting it and how we can make it more user-friendly. So just as an intro and to put what we're going to discuss today in context, I wanted to talk about some of the exciting findings of the last several years when it comes to energy efficiency. The number one takeaway we had for our 2016 fact book was focus on how the U.S. economy is becoming more energy productive. We are using less energy per unit of GDP. This chart you're looking at in front of you is in real terms, and you can see the dramatic uptick um, in GDP from 1990 to 2015, and you can see the gray line energy consumption basically staying flat. So we have had significant energy productivity gains. This shows the decoupling between uh, our economic growth and our emissions, and it's a really exciting finding. One of the questions we get when we put this slide up is, well, how much of this can you really say is being driven by energy efficiency? In the first page of our executive summary, we cite a, a study by the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy that came out in the fall of 2015 where they tried to answer that question, and they found about 60% of this energy productivity gain is from energy efficiency. Now, whether you agree with that specific number or not, when you go back through and look at all the activity that we have had in energy efficiency in the last decade in particular, you see this dramatic uptick in activity, and particularly the building sector and pace activity in the last five or seven years, it is hard to, to not draw the conclusion that energy efficiency policy and investment is, is making a big difference here. The US uh, energy mix is also going through some dramatic changes, and you can see from this slide that we are using less coal, and we are increasing our renewable energy use and increasing our natural gas use when we generate electricity. These are dramatic shifts in a very short period of time, and they're leading to some very significant outcomes. We're looking here at this slide just on greenhouse gas emissions from the power sector. And you could see that at the end of 2015, that we were approximately 18% below 2005 levels. And I think this is very important to note when we think about things like the Clean Power Plan or other uh, targets that the Obama administration has put forward. Um, we are making very good progress and energy efficiency and things like PACE are making a strong contribution. I think a second finding that I wanted to highlight related to that is we are having this dramatic change. We are using our energy more efficiently, and we are reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and we are putting um, more emphasis on clean generation and renewable energy, but it is not impacting retail and wholesale power prices. And these charts here look at both of those by region, and while there are regional differences, what you see here, especially in the wholesale power price, is a dramatic decrease uh, across the country. Retail prices, the signal is a little more muted because there's more factors going into retail power prices. The bottom line is decarbonization, more energy efficiency. They're benefiting our economy. The 
last point I wanted to show was dramatic increase in corporate involvement in clean energy. This is showing the dramatic increase you can just see from 2014 to 2015 in the uh, corporate procurement. And you can see on the right-hand side, just some, this is, of course, not comprehensive, of the different sectors that are participating. PACE is the kind of enabling um, infrastructure that gets more corporate and more in the building sector involved in energy efficiency and greenhouse gas reduction. So it's very exciting. I have some other slides, but I'm not going to talk through them. They're here for your reference. They drill down a little more deeply in energy efficiency. And again, I appreciate the opportunity for the council to be a part of this webinar with the Solar Foundation today. I'm going to turn it to Alex now. Great. Uh, thanks, Lisa. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, Zoe for her support. Uh, Lisa, and obviously the Business Council for Sustainable Energy for hosting this webinar. Uh, we were uh, pleased to have them author an op-ed last week on this topic for uh, RenewableEnergyWorld.com. I hope uh, some of our listeners got a chance to see that. Uh, I'm Alex Wynn with the Solar Foundation. We're a solar research and education nonprofit based in Washington, D.C. Uh, some of you may be familiar with our work tracking the growth of solar jobs around the country and as a technical assistance provider to local governments looking to grow the local solar market. Uh, before we get into the heart of today's webinar and our uh, fantastic lineup of other speakers, I want to quickly run through how we got here. Uh, the concepts behind PACE financing in the U.S. go back hundreds of years. Benjamin Franklin helped establish the nation's first special assessment district when he created the Union Fire Company in Philadelphia, a volunteer fire department. Uh, today, there are more than 37,000 special districts in the United States. Uh, local governments use them to pay for everything from sewer systems to sidewalks to mosquito abatement programs, all in response to important community concerns. Uh, the idea of PACE is simple. It uses a traditional municipal finance tool to help property owners pay for the upfront costs associated with energy saving improvements, like solar and efficiency measures. Uh, property owners then pay for the improvements on their property taxes over terms as long as 20 years. Uh, PACE has rapidly gained popularity because it solves a big problem. Uh, by eliminating the high upfront cost, it removes the biggest barrier to unlocking significant new investment in clean energy. So you went from this in 2010, just a few programs and a small amount of activity, uh, to this picture today. 32 states uh, plus D.C. has PACE-enabling legislation, at least 16 active markets, and dozens more in development. Uh, some of our speakers uh, will uh, address some of those markets and uh, get into more details as to their activities in them. So I'm excited uh, to tee those folks up. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars invested, particularly among the many large corporations that Lisa highlighted. Uh, we have rapidly increasing growth curves. Uh, we noticed, though, that despite these great numbers, um, that nonprofit organizations might be getting left out of the commercial pace uh, build out, particularly in 2014, we weren't hearing as much uh, about any sort of nonprofit projects as we're hearing uh, a bit more and more today. So, fortunately, in uh, 2015, though, we were awarded funding through the U.S. Department of Energy's Sunshot Initiative to focus on what we're calling the civic pace market. Uh, some of the goals of this effort include increasing installed capacity of solar among nonprofits and tax exempt entities targeting and engaging PACE markets to recognize the value of civic PACE, helping local jurisdictions work through the potential legal and financial concerns of pursuing civic PACE, and creating replicable models for future civic PACE markets. PACE is an incredibly valuable tool, and organizations like affordable housing, houses of worship, food banks, and more can really benefit from PACE and continue to focus on their civic missions. Uh, we're fortunate to be joined in this effort by Urban Ingenuity, whom you'll hear from in a moment, and Clean Energy Solutions. Uh, you can always find out more about the project and contact us by visiting civicspace.org. Uh, to be clear, nonprofit organizations face a multitude of challenges when it comes to renewable energy finance, namely poor credit, uh, low access to credit, uh, low tax appetite to monetize incentives, and uh, often an institutional aversion to debt. 
Uh, but with PACE, organizations can overcome deferred maintenance issues, uh, reach significant savings, and improve their net operating income, allowing them to focus on their missions. To get a quick sense of scale of the uh, 1.6 million nonprofits in the U.S., uh, there may be about 500,000 that could actually support solar. And if you assume around 100 uh, kW per site, which is around the average for uh, commercial uh, solar installations, we're looking at a potentially 50 gigawatt market on just nonprofits alone. Imagine reaching even one fifth of that market. So with that uh, framework in mind, I'll uh, turn it over to uh, Zoe, or, or I guess to Ken Lee. Great. Ken Lee, it is all yours. I just gave you the ability to advance your slides. Great, thank and you. Your line should be unmuted. Great. Um, and thank you um, to BCSC for this opportunity. Um, so my name is Kenley Farmer. I'm the program manager for PACE in uh, the District of Columbia. Um, so I just wanted to give a quick background on um, the program history and design. Um, so just to give you a quick summary of some of our goals in the district, um, we do have pretty aggressive sustainability goals. Um, so by 2032, we would like to cut our energy use by 50%. Um, cut our greenhouse gas emissions by 50% and um, increase our renewables to 50%, as well as um, some other targets related to our adult environment and our water use. Um, so we really saw PACE as a, a way to, um, you know, provide, I guess, a financing mechanism to achieve some of these goals. Um, and as um, mentioned earlier, um, that it could really drive um, you know, green jobs, green workforce, um, and uh, further economic development. Um, so this is a brief timeline of kind of how we started. I think PACE was originally conceived in Berkeley around 2008, um, and um, we're proud to be one of the um, early adopters um, in the district. So in 2009, um, the proposal was developed. Um, we met with key stakeholders to educate um, and get some buy-in. Um, and then the initial en enabling legislation was drafted. Um, at the same time, the White House was issuing um, its PACE policy framework. So the um, Energy Efficiency Act is the name of the law that was enacted in 2010 um, that allowed for PACE. Um, in addition, it was, it was during the time of ARA funds, so we did allocate um, a, a set aside for the design of the PACE program. At the same time, we issued um, an RFP and selected our contractor, Urban Ingenuity, um, who has been with us since that time um, and helped you know, just design this program um, from the ground up. So 2011 um, was, you know, it was a pretty, I think, heavy lift on program design. It was it's still fairly new at that time across the country. Um, so I think now there's a little bit more to learn from from other regions that are using PACE. But at this time, it was it was very much an idea um, that we were trying to figure out how to actually implement it. Um, so down to, you know, what laws are needed, what um, components are needed, even understanding more details in terms of the, the property tax mechanism um, with, within the district. Um, in 2012, the complete program design was delivered. Um, we also um, amended our enabling legislation. There were a few tweaks we realized um, that we needed to make, and, and I think that that's something if, if there are folks on the phone who are thinking about starting a PACE program, I think it's, it's definitely iterative. It, it's hard to get it right on the first shot, but you can get a lot done. Um, begin with. So um, that commenced the pilot phase of the program, and then in 2013, um, DC PACE closed its first project. Can we? Uh, yeah. This, this is Ian uh, uh, from Urban Ingenuity, the DC PACE program, and I think it's just worth noting, uh, yeah, that as you point out, in the early days, there was really, you know, very little to build off of. There were some great programs in California, Connecticut got going, but uh, it was slow to start. I think one of the things that we're seeing um, now in the last couple of years is a real acceleration. So programs are getting off the ground faster because there are better uh, examples to, to work from and models to work from. And, and in this region in particular, in D.C., we now have counties in Maryland that have come online in the last couple of months and are going to start having projects. The first county in Virginia is out to RFP now. So you're really starting to see an acceleration in this region. I imagine, you know, I think 
Cliff is going to show some numbers, too, about how the, the commercial and residential markets have really taken off uh, out there over time. So just one thing to keep in mind uh, that I think we're at a moment where this is rapidly accelerating in terms of uh, availability. Great. Yep. Thanks, Ian. Um, so just a little bit more background. Um, one one reason I think the, that we, the district, um, as a government agency, saw the value in this is we really wanted um, – we wanted it to be a public and private partnership. So, you know, there was a side where um, there were some administrative um, needs on the agency side, but we, we also wanted to allow for, um, you know, a private partner who could be more nimble in terms of the market. Um, so as I mentioned, the act was passed in 2010. Um, in the district, D.C. Pace is backed by $250 million, um, in bonding authority by the mayor. Um, and so this is what allows us to actually issue the PACE notes. Um, so as I mentioned, the fact that it would be privately administered was, was a um, priority for us. Um, and we also wanted to accommodate multiple building types. I will mention that as PACE was originally conceived in the district, it was for both commercial and residential. Um, we could have a whole separate webinar on the issues regarding residential, but for now, um, we are not doing residential. We, we do focus on commercial, which includes multifamily. Um, so again, I, I laid out, you know, some of the district sustainability goals. We really do see this as a way to increase our energy reliability, um, a way to drive economic development and job creation, um, and a way to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and I think uh, Ian is going to go into a little more detail on some of our nonprofit projects, but um, one of these is, is an affordable housing project, and um, we, at our agency, um, the nexus between energy and um, some of our low-income populations is very important to us, um, and so if there's a way that we can use PACE to be better stewards of those resources, um, it's something that's, that's very important to us, and we are um, trying to to unlock more in that um, sector. So again, this is just um, kind of a breakdown of, of the public and private partnerships. So on the left is our agency, and then on the right is Urban Ingenuity. Um, so our role as the agency is to oversee the DC PACE program. Um, we approve the final underwriting, we help issue the note, um, and we work with our Office of Tax and Revenue to make sure that um, bill collection and disbursement of proceeds um, takes place as it should. Um, Urban, our, our wonderful partners, uh, work to, um, on behalf of the D.C. government, they do um, marketing and outreach. They plan, I don't even know if I could count how many events per year, but it's a, it's a lot. Um, and then they also work through a lot of the details, including the technical and financial underwriting, um, arranging for capital, and um, working through MMV, which is measurement and verification for the projects after the construction is completed. So that's a quick background. I think now I turn it over to someone else. Yep, Ian with Urban Ingenuity is going to take it away from here. And just a quick reminder to all participants, please ask any questions you have using the Q&A function in the top middle of your screen. Um, so go ahead, Ian. It's all yours. Ian, you might be muted on your end. Yes, I am. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, okay. so yes, uh, thank you, Zoe. Thank you, Kenley. Um, uh, so yes, today I wanted to run through uh, uh, three case studies uh, for not-for-profit projects that we are uh, have done or are in the process of closing one of them right now in D.C., um, just to give you a sense of, of sort of how we can use PACE as a tool to, to help the, this kind of entity and what kind of problems we can solve with PACE. Um, you know, I think there, the tool is pretty flexible, uh, and actually in a lot of ways the PACE structure and the security attaching uh, the financing to a property as opposed to an individual entity helps in a lot of ways and actually is serving in our market in D.C., you know, a big portion of the market that actually really needs the PACE financing are um, tax-exempt entities and small and medium-sized businesses. 
because they just are harder to, to finance on, with traditional mortgages. Um, and many lenders won't serve uh, a house of worship, for instance, or a charter school. Um, so it's, it's, it's proven that PACE actually lines up, it looks like, very well with the civic PACE space in D.C. Um, we think that would hold true in, in, in a lot of other markets as well, but we know, we know D.C. best. So um, the first uh, case that I wanted to discuss uh, is um, the uh, – looks like we have a duplicate slide. Did we talk about this? Okay. So, sorry, I think I, I actually spoke to this a little bit. Um, so this is Urban Ingenuity. We, we are the, the PACE administrators, and I think you know, Kenley describes sort of our role um, sufficiently, so I won't dwell on that. Um, so the first the first case I wanted to highlight is uh, the Phyllis Wheatley YWCA, which is uh, an affordable uh, multifamily housing. It's actually transitional housing for a, a vulnerable population in, in D.C., um, and they were going through a major rehab uh, at, at the site. And... They were already pretty far down the road when they approached the PACE program, and the problem they were having is that they had identified an energy project um, that could further drive down the operating costs on an ongoing basis um, for the for the project's uh, developer um, and and man ongoing manager. But they they you know they just were limited on how much capital that they they could get from other sources, and so as often happens. Um, Pace, or, or rather the, the efficiency and the green elements were going to get value engineered out of this project. They probably just would have put in the basic minimum code requirement items. Uh, and what Pace did coming into the capital stack was allow them to add in solar. It was allowed them to go to LED lighting. Um, and it let them fix a bunch of things they needed to fix, but do it in as efficient manner or as possible while improving the operation of, of the uh, facility. And actually, at the end of the day, in addition to preserving and improving the quality of housing, they actually were able to drive down some of the rents for some of the tenants. So obviously, there were multiple elements that helped support that, but the, the fact that they're paying less on their energy bills is, is directly linked to it. And, and it's, uh, I think, a powerful statement that, that you know, not only are you doing the, the green thing, but you're also uh, achieving other goals. This was a really good project. It, it's the first HUD approval of a PACE project um, the nationally, and just so those you know, for those on the line, uh, typically in most markets, you know, the the program administrators will require that uh, to get a pace note that you get the consent of your primary mortgage holder. Um, and in this case, because it was a multi-layered financing that included several district agencies and a private capital equity source and HUD subsidy, we actually ended to get uh, approval from several parties, um, and including HUD, uh, but it's that's a really good precedent. Um, so just a little bit about the economics, and I won't go – mostly I want you guys to have these so when they, when they share it, but, you know, at the end of the day, there's going to be about $7,000 of net operating uh, uh, savings uh, when, you, when you factor in the utility savings against the PACE payments. This deal also, by including the solar um, – we, we paired it with a PPA structure that allowed, you know, the, the not-for-profit uh, sponsor at the site, the, the Y, didn't have a tax appetite. But by pairing uh, the PACE with a PPA, we were able to actually bring some additional benefit to the property and to the developer um, who had an appetite for the, for the tax benefits or the investment tax credit and the depreciation. So, again, I think it's a uh, um, way to expand using PACE and PPA together expands sort of what you can do and, and the, the total benefit of the project. Um, so, pardon me. The, I, these are some of the, the specific numbers. Um, Alex made a point about you know, uh, not-for-profits and civic institutions, oftentimes they go through capital book campaigns to raise money to do major projects. Um, and one of the nice things about using someone else's money or using the PACE financing is, that the money that they raise for their capital campaign can then really be put to services. And this high, you know, this is one way to highlight that. You know, if instead of using $700,000 out of pocket, they use PACE, it comes $0 out of pocket. Yes, they have an annual PACE payment, but the net is you're still cash flow positive on a year-to-year -year basis. And um, instead of using that $700,000 of your capital campaign money, you can put that towards services. And, and this is 
an institution that does counseling and a bunch of other support services for its members. So keeping that $700,000 in their pockets is, is a valuable, uh, you know, is of great value to them. Um, just a little bit on the HUD piece, uh, and again, if there's anyone who's interested, happy to answer questions later or, or following, uh, at, you know, at a later time, talk about, about this. But basically, HUD's concern um, in all of this was that when they when they fund this kind of affordable housing through a mixed financing, um, they want to make sure that the property is maintained as affordable housing for a period of time, typically 40 years. And so they put a deed of restrictive covenants or a declaration of trust that preserves that. Um, and this gets into sort of the, the details of recording order on a property. But basically, PACE, doesn't you know as the pace program we don't care that you know we're ha more than happy to keep that preservation of use um in place uh but still have a special assessment on the property so this is just talking a little bit about the the documentation structure that we had to go through to get everybody comfortable with that um uh, you may have heard that pace six senior to the mortgage but in this case we are subordinating to this one declaration of trust so again, that's that's a, a detail, but again, it's an interesting one, and it has implications that you know now that we've gone through this approval with HUD, this model can be replicated in this type of financing structure with other uh, housing authorities and HUD around the country. So the second uh, case study we wanted to talk about and is a pay secure PPA um, uh, at a house of worship, and. This case, you know, the problem that we're solving that pay solves, again, the church didn't want to come out of pocket for a series of improvements that, you know, they've just got a lot of deferred maintenance. Actually, it's across four properties that they own, a church, a school, uh, a family life center, and a, uh, a food bank. So lots of deferred maintenance. Um, you know, they don't want to come out of their own capital budgets to make it, you know, it's just harder for them to do that. So PACE gives them the 100% money up front. Again, the PACE PPA, um, this is an entity that a, a PPA provider would have trouble um, underwriting, a traditional PPA, because they're concerned about the church's ability to pay the electricity bill over the long term, you know, for the next 15 years or so. Um, and it is, it's a quirky credit, unless you understand churches, and there are a few financial institutions that do, um, a lot of groups will just steer away from a church because of, you know they, they don't understand their their credit they you know they are worried about the risk of foreclosing on a church etc. Um, what a PACE PPA does is that on a uh, for the power purchase agreement it actually made the church eligible for a PPA and and the willingness for the tax equity to come in is really tied to the to the fact that you're shifting. Um, Instead of you basically the, the simple way to describe it is instead of paying an energy bill to a PPA provider, the church is now going to be paying its electricity bill or the equivalent of its electricity bill through a PACE payment, through a special property tax assessment. So we basically just replace that PPA payment to the tax equity or to the special purpose entity that that you know owns the panels to a, a PACE payment. So it's sort of a really elegant way to to shift some of that risk. Um, and again, the the church has you know it's in the middle of D.C. It's in, uh, near a metro stop, so we know that the property is going to continue to have value. The church is you know that in the long term, lowering its operating expenses is going to continue to allow it to to stay in place and offer those mission critical services. Um, and Pace was just a great way to to support both the solar but also a, a deep energy retrofit and and water retrofit. It also actually, in this case, there's enough benefit in doing this pace PPA structure that they're able to retire their mortgage debt, which for the church, um, they had made promises to their, their congregation that they were going to uh, have the sanctuary debt free. And so there's just a, a lot of benefits for them in using this kind of a financing approach. So, and again, here is just the, an analysis of the cash uh, benefits to them over time, a mix of utility savings, operating and maintenance savings. Um, they get some PPA money back because of the way we structured the, the PPA. Um, 
and uh, all in all, it's a, it's a very attractive deal for the church. So, again, I, I touched on these paces, the credit enhancement. It, it simplifies, it actually simplifies the underwriting because it ties it to the asset and, and uh, away from the actual credit of the borrower. Um, in this case, you know, the church could get financing from traditional mortgages if they were willing to get personal guarantees. The PACE mitigates that need to do that, and that makes the church happy, and I think this is you know, similar for a lot of other nonprofits. And then, um, you know, it increases the overall benefits because the church couldn't participate in the tax equity um, or the tax benefits without this PACE-enabled PPA structure. Um, again, this is for digest, and this is just sort of what the PACE PPA um, transaction structure looks like in flow of funds. Happy to, to go through that with anyone after the fact if they're, they're interested. And uh, I'll accelerate through this last case study so, so that we can get to Cliff and then get to questions. Um, the last deal is an office space, but it's uh, an owned, it's an office built, uh, space that's being renovated and, and built out for a not-for-profit um, in the Anacostia neighborhood of D.C. Um, and the, the really neat thing about this deal is that we are, it's again part of a capital stack that's being put together for this major renovation where um, PACE is going to come in for $2 million. It's going to help replace a bunch of the energy systems. Um, but because of the, the main financing is going to be used in what with a basic it's called an industrial revenue bond so it's a it's a tax exempt bond we're able to actually use that tax exempt we're getting a tax exempt opinion and able to mirror that that tax exempt uh, structure with the pace notes we're able to get it bring even cheaper capital into this project through a pace note because we're able to 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 use the tax exempt um, structure. Um, and so again, here's here's the capital stack. You can sort of see there's the, the tax bond, uh, the, the traditional uh, financing, which is a revenue bond of $6 million. They've got a mortgage of $2 million. They're getting a grant from the government. And then the financing gap of $2 million is going to be handled by PACE. So again, they wouldn't go as deep on the energy efficiency uh, without this extra financing. So I think that covers the, the basics, and I will uh, just you know, reiterate from the civic PACE perspective, PACE is an assessment at the public benefit. Um, it's allowing you to make improvements to your property that have both a direct benefit to the owner, but also in, you know, adds a public benefit. Um, and uh, so we think that, again, bringing PACE to the civic sector is, is, is a vital piece of, uh, of our running our program here in D.C. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Cliff to talk about California and elsewhere. Great. Thanks, Ian. Um, and also thanks, uh, Zoe and the Business Council for putting all this together. A lot of interesting, exciting stuff happening in, in the world of PACE, and um, love to see all the activity in D.C. It's great. Um, so... Um, very quickly, uh, so we, I am with Renew Financial. Um, we are based in um, Oakland, California, and I think it was mentioned earlier that PACE comes from uh, or was, was born sort of in uh, Berkeley, and that was uh, our founder and CEO, Cisco DeVries, who put the first PACE program together in Berkeley. And then um, we worked with several hundred governments uh, in many states over the last uh, seven, eight years to develop PACE programs. Um, we innovated the PACE model here in California back in, you know, 2007, 2008. Um, as I think many folks know, you know, ran into some regulatory issues with the Federal Housing Finance Agency in 2010. Um, but then we're able to launch our residential program, uh, which is now serving about 80% of the state of California. So California First is our residential PACE program. Um, we did our first securitization of our PACE bonds uh, last September. Um, we offer both commercial as well as residential uh, PACE, and so we did about $24 million worth of PACE, commercial PACE projects last year and about $120 million worth of residential PACE. Um, and on the commercial side, you know, as similar to what Ian was describing there, you know, it's been interesting to see how the market has evolved and um, everything from, 
you know, shopping centers and big hotels to, you know, we did the, uh, a retrofit for the Child Abuse Prevention Center in Sacramento. So in the nonprofit world as well as the, the for-profit um, and the whole range of pace improvements. So, you know, solar, but also energy efficiency and water efficiency, um, which are all allowed here in California, as well as seismic improvements are in, in California. Um, so we, and we will be launching, uh, since we didn't really think that the folks in Florida would want to have a California First program, um, we'll be launching our, uh, what we're calling Renew Pace, uh, program in Florida uh, in June of this year. So uh, looking forward to bringing some uh, of the residential as well as commercial to, to Florida as well. Um, and I just want to give folks a quick sense of, of the growth of the residential market um, in California. And so this is all California um, over the last uh, four years. And as you can see, we're now up over a billion dollars, about $1.5 billion worth of residential pace that has been originated, um, not just by us, but by other, the rest of the, the residential pace market in California. Um, it's, it's growing, as you can see, quickly. Uh, and my guess is, um, you know, this year we could see a billion dollars alone in, in California um, in this year. So it's, um, you know, continuing what we're, we're seeing really is that um, on the residential side in particular, you know, PACE meets a market need that, um, that customers have, that homeowners have for a, a reasonably priced um, financing alternative to get not only solar but also energy efficiency work done. Um, it also meets the need that contractors have. So, uh, you know, the technology platform that we and that other, other competitors in this space have developed um, makes it easy to get a, a homeowner approved for financing quickly and to um, get a project done quickly. So that, that has um, really met a need that, that contractors have had in the marketplace. Um, and then just to give you a sense of um, what those, you know, I mean, on the one hand, you know, it's great to see a billion and a half worth of projects completed, and that's important on the financing side. But, you know, PACE is a public-private partnership, and uh, our public sector entities um, really are focused on the environmental benefits as well as the job benefits. And as you can see, um, the industry has, has had a significant impact uh, on both energy use as well as water use. And, you know, in California, we we have a continuing drought on, so uh, the water use gets a lot of attention out here. Um, and then, you know, in terms of local job creation, most of the projects that are completed are done by contractors who work within 40 miles of their home office. So um, this is, it's very local, and um, it has meant a lot to uh, local contractors who have have developed PACE programs or projects over the last several years. Um, you know, we have about 1,500 contractors in our network. Other uh, PACE providers have also, in you know, over a thousand, a couple thousand contractors, all of whom are then, you know, licensed, bonded, registered with the program, um, but then are also able to offer um, and financing to their customers and have grown their businesses as a result of the use of PACE. Um, so I, I want to give folks uh, a sense of what's been happening on the residential front. It's, you know, different in topic than, than uh, what we've been focusing on mostly through this the webinar, but um, it's a very exciting time. And I think we're really reaching a tipping point where we're going to see more local governments around the country begin to use residential as, as well as commercial. And with that, let me... Uh, uh, kick it back to Zoe and, and open it up for questions. Great. Thanks so much, Cliff, and thank you to all of our speakers. That was a really great perspective on a number of different angles on PACE financing. Um, so I am going to actually kick it over to Alex with the Solar Foundation. We've been compiling a number of questions throughout the presentation through the Q&A function, so if you have any, please ask them there, and Alex um, with the Solar Foundation will present them to the speakers and give them a chance to, uh, to respond. 
Great, thanks, Doug. Yeah, uh, so we've gotten a couple good questions in, and uh, there's a few uh, questions uh, sort of clarifying uh, the role of uh, PACE administrators and how these uh, projects are uh, measured long term. So I want to uh, get to those uh, first before we pivot back to some of these uh, civic PACE sort of focus questions. And so the first one we got from the audience is uh, on whether or not the tax uh, assessments as they're referring to on um, projects cover all of the PC government's uh, program administration costs or the PACE program administrator's costs, or are those costs uh, simply borne by all DC taxpayers? So maybe uh, Ian or Cliff can speak to, uh, or Kenley, how the um, uh, projects generate revenue to support uh, administration. Sure, I'll speak for DC. Every every jurisdiction is a little different, but in DC, the program is supported from uh, a, an administration fee that happens at closing, so that's a one-time fee. Um, and then there is uh, an ongoing uh, servicing fee that are also built in um, because over time, uh, the administrator has responsibility for you know, you know, doing basic servicing functions. If a uh, you know a payment hasn't been made, tracking down the owner, figuring out what's gone on, if it has been paid but it's gotten lost, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, um, the the in theory, it's basically or fees at, at origination and then an ongoing fee. Um, the program uh, with the at the initial setup stage, the District of Columbia had funding to set up and support uh, the program design, and then it being operated at no cost to the district. And that's actually a fairly standard uh, uh, amongst private administrators. There's There are not, uh, nationwide, there are not a lot of ongoing fees from the jurisdictions. But, but if you, you guys may have uh, seen some different structures where the jurisdiction is actually paying for the administration, but I'm not, I'm not aware of those. Yeah, no, I think I mean, we, we operate pretty similarly, so we also have uh, administrative fees that are, are uh, essentially like closing costs. They can be wrapped into the financing and financed as well. Um, mm -hmm. And no, we've not, most, I don't know of any jurisdictions really that are, are supporting the PACE programs financially at this point. Uh, this is um, one of the reasons why this is attractive to local governments is that uh, there is very little cost and uh, very little liability for the local government. So that, that's, um, you know, which means that all of the costs of the program need to be baked into the, the fee structure that we have. Yeah. Connecticut does have a state-administered program that local jurisdictions opt into. And so, as Cliff points out, the local jurisdictions don't pay anything, but there is state funding at their green bank uh, to administer the program, but that's, I think, a fairly unique structure, and I think most of it is privately administered um, programs. Great. Uh, we got a, another question um, about m and uh, Specifically, they're asking uh, Ian to comment on how projected energy savings, maybe uh, Cliff can speak to this as well, um, are, are monitored and verified on an ongoing basis. Um, this person's asking about the, the House of Worship project, although that's, that's incomplete, but maybe there's some other projects you can speak to about whether or not they have met or actually beat uh, their uh, expected returns. Yeah. Um, so uh, in D.C., we have a requirement that they do m and for a couple of years just to uh, – make sure that things are, are working. Um, again, there's not a huge body of evidence yet. Uh, and in some cases, um, there may be longer periods of m and uh, especially if there's a performance contract in place. But again, that's really up to the property owner if they want to pursue that kind of uh, structure. Um, and then DC also has, an on has a benchmarking uh, law, and so buildings above a certain size have to benchmark anyway every year. Um, so, again, there, there's, the, there's a tension because we're interested in it, uh, knowing how the projects are performing and what savings we're achieving. At the same time, the market doesn't really want to pay a ton of money um, 
for real rigorous M and V unless they are in some sort of performance guarantee type structure. Um, so I think over time, you know, increasingly promoting things like the Energy Star benchmarking, which is already sort of a standard in DC and is is relatively straightforward, maybe the way that we we go. But um, uh, you know, I think on the on the one project, one of the projects we had the the MNV sort of revealed the fact that something had gotten done incorrectly in the first quarter year because production was real low on the solar, and so you know that was sort of a signal. And we went back and fixed it, um, and so and then that, and then since then it's actually been producing above what they were anticipating. But that's you know that's one story. I don't know, Cliff, what what you guys require in in California or elsewhere? Yeah, no, so. Similarly, I mean, we actually do not require uh, M and V, and as you point out, I mean, I think the issue really is all all those costs that I was just saying have to be baked into the financing costs. Um, so we have we've got voluntary M and V, but not required, um, because it, we find it, you know, very much in our interest to track um, both on the residential as well as commercial sides what the um, energy savings will be, and we've got a pilot program actually on the residential side that we're doing with one of the utilities in California um, to get, uh, you know, the homeowner's utility data uh, in order to track this on an ongoing basis, but it's a pilot at this point. Great. Uh, a question uh, more about uh, civic pace and nonprofits. Are there any uh, specific obstacles that the property owners, contractors uh, should consider when pursuing uh, pace projects on nonprofit properties? Are there particular considerations as far as lender consent or, or financial structuring that's unique? Um, well, lender consent is, is certainly an issue any, in, you know, with any borrower. In some ways, uh, I think the not-for-profits have been easier for us because they're less likely to have a large commercial mortgage that, you know, sort of a standard commercial mortgage that's gone into a CMBS structure, you know, which is much harder to get consent on. So you know, a lot of the not-for-profits have, uh, you know, local lenders who, who have issued their mortgages and hold their notes and they really know these not-for-profits inside and out. Um, and so we've actually had a really good track record getting those types of entities that are already used to unusual credits being comfortable with having a pace note ahead of them. Um, I guess, you know, there are special kinds of financing that, you know, some types of federally secured finance, you know, I don't know if not-for-profits can get SBA lending. We've had some SBA loans that we've come across um, with for-profit companies. Um, but uh, so those are a little bit tricky. Um, but we're, we're actually working to fix the policy fix on that now. Right. Uh, can uh, jurisdictions without the uh, sort of scale of, of DC or uh, amount of funding that DC has uh, sort of recreate the level of success that uh, DC is seeing? Maybe across California, are there examples of you know much smaller cities? Are, are they taking advantage of pace at the same level? Well, yeah, I can talk about that. I, you know, what what we've the structure that we built in California actually allows um, jurisdictions of all sizes to opt into a statewide program, so that we're able to achieve scale by having a one uh, what is in California called a joint powers authority um, that is sponsored by the California League of Cities and the California Association of Counties. Um, most local governments are already members of this entity, and so um, they can simply opt in at no cost to them and with no liability, and then, then we can operate a program essentially statewide. So um, I, that, I think, is a structure that works well. It's very difficult for a smaller city, um, and even D.C., I think, as it goes to residential, I mean, it would be... It, it, the administrative overhead of running a program becomes challenging um, and, and much more challenging for the, a smaller entity. Um, so it's, it's very helpful to develop a structure that allows many local governments to join forces together to um, go to scale. 
Right. And, and specifically on California, we got a question about whether or not um, property owners can pursue water-only improvements, um, or are they all energy-focused improvements? Yeah, no, they can do water only. Uh, so, it, you know, drought tolerant landscaping, um, artificial turf, other kinds of water saving measures. Definitely, uh, you can do as, as a standalone or in combination with either energy efficiency or renewable energy. Great. Uh, it looks like we are at uh, time, so we want to uh, let the uh, audience. Uh, uh, jump off if uh, they have to and stick to our, our commitment as well as our speakers. So I want to thank everyone for uh, participating and thank BCSE for hosting this event. Uh, any audience members who didn't get uh, any of their questions answered can go to citizpace.org and uh, find this slide deck um, and, uh, and contact us and reach out to any of the uh, speakers. We'll be happy to connect you as well. So uh, thanks again to uh, Ian, Kenley, and Cliff, and uh, thanks to Zoe and Lisa. Take care, everyone. Have a great afternoon. And thank you to all the Solar Foundation, and thanks, everyone, for participating. Have a good afternoon.